Um, we are in Esther chapter 6, and so if you have a Bible with you, uh, now is a good time to turn there. If you don't, it's all right. We're going to have the, the verses up on the screen. Uh, but as you're, if you're turning there, I'd like to begin with a story of uh, an amazing coincidence. I was listening to a podcast that I love to listen to called This American Life, and they did an entire show on coincidences, and this was the best one. Uh, this was told by a guy named Paul. So a number of years ago, uh, Paul was dating a girl, and he, he wasn't sure if she was the one. He wasn't sure if he should keep dating her. In fact, he was trying to decide if he should ask her out again for that Friday night. And as Paul was, you know, thinking about these things, he was on his way to the deli in his neighborhood where I guess he gets his lunch. He first went to the store, bought something, got some change, went to the deli. And uh, as he was about to pay for his sandwich, he pulled out some bills from his wallet. And there on the dollar bill in his wallet was the name of the girl that he was dating, that he was thinking of asking about on Friday night. And he looked at it and he thought, this must be a sign. I'm, I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to date her. I'm supposed to ask her out. So that's what he did. But what he actually did was he didn't, he didn't spend that dollar. He kept it and he put it in a frame and he wrapped it up and he gave it to her. So we asked her out on Friday night. He said, look, I have something for you. He was all excited. And she opened it up and she looked at it and was kind of like bewildered. And he said, it's a dollar with your name on it. Isn't that great? I was thinking about you. And then there's the dollar with your name on it. And she, and she just looked shocked. And he said, what, what's wrong? She kind of pulled herself together and said, uh, nothing, it, it's, it's fine, it's, it's fun, that's great, uh, let's, let's go out to dinner. So they did, they went out to dinner, they dated, in fact, uh, they kept dating and they got married. Years later, uh, they're moving out of their apartment and they come across this, this dollar bill, framed dollar bill, and Paul says to her, hey, you, you never told me why you were so freaked out about this, this dollar, what, what's up with it? She said, well, look, here's the thing. When I was 19 years old, uh, I was working at a copy shop downtown, and I was dating this guy, but I, I didn't really know if he was the one. And I was thinking to myself, how do you know if, if they're the one, if they're the one you're supposed to marry? And she said, I, I, I couldn't figure it out. So what I decided to do was to write my name on a few dollar bills and just give them out uh, in change during that day. And then I thought to myself, if ever I find a guy with that dollar bill, then I'll know he's the one I'm supposed to marry. And I... I didn't tell you at the time because I thought it would totally freak you out and you thought we'd have to get married. So I just kept it to myself. But that's, that's what I've been thinking the whole time when we were dating is you are the one. Amazing coincidence, right? Great story. But the coincidences, they don't stop there. In fact, this coincidence is something just for us. Because guess the name of the girl, the name that was written on the dollar bill and pen. What do you think her name was? Esther. Her name was Esther, and we are in the book of Esther. I was thinking about this and preparing for this. That's amazing. This is true. Look up uh, episode 49, This American Life. That, I mean, that's a lot of coincidences. And the thing about coincidences is they, I mean, they kind of take our breath away sometimes because they give us the impression that the, the events of our life are actually connected in some deep, unseen ways. It kind of blows our mind sometimes. We hear stories like that. I want to give you a definition of coincidence. It was given on the, on the podcast. I think it's helpful. Here's, here's what they say. Here's what a coincidence is. It's a surprising concurrence of events perceived as uh, being meaningfully related with no apparent causal connection. So the, the meaningfully related part, I think, is the part that, that grabs us. Coincidences, when, when they happen, they make us wonder, look, maybe there is some deep meaning in the universe. If you're a Christian, you, you probably take it as an affirmation that, in fact, God is at work behind the scenes of our lives. And that's exactly what we see in Esther chapter 6. We're going to see today that this is a chapter filled with coincidences, and they do give the distinct impression that even though God remains hidden in this story, uh, he is at work. In fact, he is at work at all the details of, of the story. And so we're going to read it through. Uh, just before we do, a quick reminder Chapter 5 ended with a cliffhanger. Uh, remember, Haman was very, very angry at Mordecai because he snubbed him again. And so we had this giant gallows made. He wanted to hang him. And he'd planned to go see the king to ask if he could kill Mordecai. And so that very night uh, is where we continue. Here's, here's uh, chapter 6, verse 1. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. 
And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. Okay, we'll pause there for a moment because we already see some coincidences. Um, on the night that Haman uh, is hatching a murderous plot to kill Mordecai, uh, the king just happens to have trouble sleeping, and he just happens to ask for the book of the kingdom, I guess, to be read to him, and his attendant opens it to the part about Mordecai and tells about when Mordecai saved his life, remember back in, in chapter 2, and the king just happens to think, we got to do something for this guy, and so he begins to make plans, he wants to know how to do it, and he's talking about, you know, the same man that Haman is on his way to come and talk to the king about killing him, so... Lots of coincidences. Here's how it keeps going. Verse 4. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman, who had just entered the outer court and the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. So Haman's pride is quite obviously blinding him or blinded him to what the king was actually talking about. Um, it's interesting that Haman seems to have this list of how he wants to be honored just at the ready. Like he was just hoping that someone would ask him, what, what do you want done for you to be, to be honored? Of course the king he thinks is talking about him. And we see uh, a window into his immense ego. I mean, to be dressed in the king's robes is to be basically honored as the king and to ride the king's horse. And I don't know if you noticed, but the king's horse is somehow wearing a crown. That's the, the grandeur of this scene that he wants to have happen to him. And we get the pleasure of imagining what his face is going to look like when he finds out that the king is not talking about him. In fact, coincidentally, he's talking about the man that Haman came to talk to him about killing Mordecai, of course. So here's verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry! Take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Oh, what a dramatic reversal. And, and what we have to note here is this actually is the beginning of a number of dramatic reversals uh, in the story. I mean, Haman, the man consumed with pride, is thoroughly humiliated in front of the whole city. Mordecai, uh, the Jew who's condemned to death with the rest of the Jews, he's elevated. I mean, he's raised up in front of the entire city. Uh, this scene actually signals um, a, a shift in fortune for Haman. Uh, not just for that moment, but for the rest of the story. And uh, we start to see this when he goes back to his house and, and tells his wife what happened. Here's verse 12. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Now that last part is, is interesting. Uh, Haman's wife and his friends immediately have the sense that this, this misfortune is no accident, that something bigger is going on. In fact, their sense of foreboding comes true almost immediately because the very last verse of our chapter is kind of the connecting point into verse, uh, uh, chapter 7. And here's what verse 14 says. While they were yet talking, so they're talking about this, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring him into the feast that Esther had prepared. Remember, Esther had invited him and the king to this feast where she was going to uh, sort of talk about this, this plot to kill the Jews. And, and I don't want to give too much away about what's going to happen. Let, let's just say, though, that things are not going to go well for Haman. 
Uh, what happens at the feast is not good for him, not what he hopes will happen, and this sense of, uh, of foreboding, of falling before Mordecai comes almost immediately true. So, that's chapter 6. And I think you could say, I mean, you could simply say, look, this is a chapter full of coincidences. But what I want us to see is that those coincidences are just, are just one part of something even more significant that we see here in the text, which is that we see some of the key ways that God is working in the world. We see some of the key ways he's working in the lives of these people at that time, but also how he still continues to work today. So we're going to focus on two of them, two ways that we see God working, and the first one is this. God uses insignificant things in powerful ways. Insignificant things in powerful ways... Uh, I want to illustrate this by uh, talking about something. I haven't heard about this in a while, so I don't know if this is still a thing, but when I was young, like in my teens, uh, whenever we would watch sports on TSN, there was something called the TSN turning point. Anyone remember that? Um, if you don't remember, I have a graphic that I found that might jog your memory. So let's play it. This is the TSN turning point intro. Still brings back memory. So when they would play that, the announcer would then go on to pinpoint, they'd pick one uh, time in a game. It could be any kind of game, hockey game, football, whatever it is. And they would say this event, so usually it was like a goal or a big hit or interception. They would say this was the turning point. This was the, the moment when the, when the momentum shifted towards the winning team. And they'd explain why it you know, was, the, was the big shift. And I mentioned that because, I don't know if you noticed it, but there is a TSN turning point in the book of Esther. The interesting thing, though, is that it's not where you would expect it to be. I mean, if you were to pinpoint, uh, you know, some time where things began to change in the book of Esther, probably you would guess chapter 5. Not just because it's in the middle of the book, but because that, that is when the big dramatic moment happens. That's when Esther, you know, she said, look, I'm going to go see the king. If I die, I die. And she walks into the throne room and the king pardons her. And then she begins to put her plan into motion. That is the biggest dramatic event of the story, but that's not actually where things shift. Because if you notice, things continue to get worse for God's people after that moment. In fact, it's after that moment that Haman plots to kill Mordecai. There is a moment, though, that happens in the story, and after that moment, things only get better. And the moment is very small. You want to know what it is? It's it's when the king can't sleep. That is the moment everything changes. Let me show it in the story. I'm just going to put it up on the screen so we can see it. In chapters 1 to 5, if you were just to look back over those chapters, you would see that they're filled with bad news for God's people. Uh, Haman plots against the Jews. Uh, His plot is accepted by the king. The edict of death of the Jews, uh, it goes out throughout all the land, and Haman plots to kill Mordecai. So it's bad news after bad news after bad news. Chapters 6 to 10 is pretty much all good news for God's people. I don't want to spoil everything, but I mean, we've already seen that Mordecai's life is saved. We're going to see that Haman is dealt with. Uh, spoiler alert, the Jews do not get wiped out. So it's, it's all good news. The point that changes everything, though, is Esther 6, verse 1, which is this. On that night, the king could not sleep. From there, the king is reminded about Mordecai saving his life, which leads to him wanting to honor Mordecai, which messes up Haman's plan to kill Mordecai and humiliates Haman. It brings more and more good for God's people and things get worse and worse and worse for Haman. Something ordinary, something insignificant, like a sleepless night shifts the entire momentum of the story. What does this tell us? It tells us that in God's hands, even the most mundane and ordinary thing can be used for extremely significant purposes. In fact, what it should do is kind of open our eyes or maybe remind us of the fact that our lives are filled with these kinds of ordinary, mundane, seemingly insignificant things. And in fact, they are all full of providential meaning and purpose. In fact, the mistake is thinking that God only works through dramatic events or important people. I mean, he does. Like the parting of the Red Sea, that was a dramatic event. God clearly worked there in miracles. But God has always used ordinary means to accomplish his amazing purposes. Let me think about the disciples. They were nothing special. In fact, Paul tells them as much when he's writing to them in in 1 Corinthians. 
He says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He's saying, look, that's that's how God tends to work. That he takes those that the world thinks is, is not that important, not that powerful, and he uses it for his amazing purposes. And part of the reason he does that is to magnify his own power, his own glory. Another thing we can think of is the cross. Now, in our day, um, the cross is packed with meaning. I mean, it's a, it's a symbol of great significance. But back in the first century, I mean, it was an ordinary, shameful thing to be crucified. And, and it was something that happened fairly often. Uh, in the history books, we can see uh, right around the time that Jesus was born, uh, the Roman general Varus, he, he crucified 2,000 Jews outside of Jerusalem to put down a rebellion. I mean, the streets just lined with crosses. The, the Romans crucified people all, all the time. So for the Roman soldiers, uh, nailing Jesus to the cross, that was like just another day at the office. That was something they did all the time. There's nothing significant about it for them. And for the Jewish people at the time, Uh, Being crucified was not something special either. In fact, it was pitiable. That was not the significant moment that they were waiting for in terms of Messiah. They they wanted a Messiah to come with power. They they wanted lightning from heaven and and military might. That's the kind of thing they were looking for. That's when, when God would really do something special. But in fact, it was the cross that became the pivot point for all of humanity. Think about it. Up to the cross... Satan, sin, and death seem to always have the upper hand for humanity. The whole way through, thousands of years. Ne- never any clarity about how exactly people could escape that. And after the cross, Satan, sin, and death were defeated, and there is nothing but hopefulness for those who believe in Jesus. The, the pivot point, the turning point was the cross, something ordinary, something despised, something that n- no one would have ever thought that that would be the thing that would bring hope into the world. See, the point is that God uses insignificant things, and he still does. He still does in our lives. And it's essential that we understand this because it's very tempting for us to look to the things that the world thinks is significant and think to ourselves, look, if I want a life of value, if I want a life of worth, then I need to have a life like that, which usually involves power, recognition, approval, wealth. And in some way, we think, if if I have that, then there'll be some, some value attached to my life And if we do that, there's a very good chance we're going to miss some of the more important things, the truly good things that God is doing in the less notable areas of our life. And I think there's probably application points here for all of us. Because probably all of us have some aspect of our our life that that doesn't seem very consequential. It seems like it's it's kind of pointless. We we know we're supposed to do it. We have some responsibility there or, or whatever it may be. And yet we think to ourselves, man, this isn't really worth it. The example that comes to my mind is an example that I think can't be uh, mentioned enough. And that is the example of motherhood. I mean, mean, parenting itself is is, is difficult. It's difficult because it it happens in kind of the daily grind of life. But for mothers in particular, there's this sense, especially when the kids are younger, that you're living the same day over and over and over again. That you're wiping the same noses and cleaning up the same messes and feeding the same kids and doing the same laundry, breaking up the fights that happen over and over and over. You could look back over six months and think to yourself, it's like the movie Groundhog Day. It just keeps happening again and again and nothing changes. And the temptation there is to think, look, there must be something better I could be doing with my time. Before I was a mom, I used to feel validated. I used to feel important. And now it just does not feel like anything is actually going on that's, that's worth it. And that's a lie. It's not true. See, if we take a step back and we think about what human beings need, think about it. What what is it? What is the thing that if a human being has it, they they can get through pretty much anything in life? Of course, faith in God, but in terms of their own self-understanding, what they need, they need to feel loved. They, They need to know that they are valued, they are cared for. And that can happen in a lot of different ways, but it happens best when you get it from your mom or your dad. That's what's happening in all of those little mundane moments of of your day for for two decades when you are parenting a child. That they are are gleaning from you a sense of worth. 
And that for Christian parents, it's an opportunity to say, yes, you do have worth. I do love you because God loves me. It's in the, it's in the nitty-gritty details, the things that seem inconsequential where God is doing powerful things in each family, and I would say in each of our lives. That the danger for us is thinking that because it's not big or it's not dramatic, that it's, it's not meaningful. But in fact, God does some of his best work in the small, seemingly insignificant details of our life. God used a sleepless night for the king of Persia to save Mordecai's life. And the king didn't even knew he, know he was being used. So imagine how fruitful our lives and our families will be if we seek to be faithful and trusting with every aspect of our lives, no matter how small, no matter how insignificant in the world's eyes, to believe that God is at work and that as we are faithful, we're going to see his plans come to fruition. And that leads us to the second point. Firstly, that God uses insignificant things in powerful ways. Secondly, God has meticulous sovereignty. God has meticulous sovereignty. By meticulous, I mean like absolute, like every single detail. And by sovereignty, I mean control. God has absolute control over everything in the universe. Now, we began by talking about coincidences. But the truth, the biblical truth, is that there is actually no such thing as coincidence when it comes to God's universe. Everything is part of God's plan. In fact, you could say a correct understanding of the sovereignty of God fills in the gaps that are there in coincidences, where you see things kind of fitting together. It, it's God who brings them together. I want to show you the relationship between these two things uh, through the definitions. So let me put up the, the definition of a coincidence again. We said that it was a surprising concurrence of events uh, perceived as meaningfully related with no apparent causal connection. But sovereignty is, is then sometimes surprising concurrence of events that are actually meaningfully related with a divine causal connection. Now, the difference here is not just semantics. It's not just some, some wordplay. This radically changes our view of the universe. And it's essential for a strong faith in God because there's a big difference between living in a universe where things just happen and where it seems like maybe there's something going on or living in a universe, in a universe where we know everything happens according to God's plan. It, it, it's a totally different thing. And what we see here in our chapter is in fact that God is orchestrating the events of their lives and that there is meaning behind the things that are going on. The ironic part about this chapter is that it's actually God's enemies, like it's Haman and his wife and his advisors. They are the ones who start to think to themselves, hmm, I wonder if something else is going on here. Uh, let's look at it again. Now, I want to show you um, the difference between the way that Haman's wife responds at the end of chapter 5 and then the end of chapter 6. You'll see a big difference. Here's chapter 5. Remember, uh, Mordecai just uh, offended Haman again. And he comes back and he's whining about it, moaning about it. And here's their response in chapter 5. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows 50 cubits high be made. And in the morning, tell the, uh, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased, pleased Haman and he had the gallows made. So at that point, Haman's wife is like, look, you're the second most powerful man in the kingdom. If, if Mordecai is bugging you, just have him killed. Just go to the king, build a giant gallows for some reason, and hang him there so everyone will know that you're the most powerful and no one can, no one can disrespect you. But look at the shift at the end of chapter 6. Again, he comes back. He's all you know, upset because he's been made a fool of. And look at their response now, verse 13. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. So what's the difference? Well, the difference here is, is somehow, someway, Haman's wife and his advisors, they have the sense that a greater power is at work. That they're not sure exactly how. They think it has something to do with him being Jewish, but they're sort of saying, look, there's something going on here. There's something bigger going on here that you can't fight against. And you kind of hear people say that sometimes as they talk about the events in their life. You'll, you'll he hear people say something like, well, you know, uh, everything happens for a reason. Or, or God must be doing something. God must be at work. But we have to be careful because there's, there's a big difference between saying, look, God might be doing something and actually knowing who God is. 
There's a big difference between saying there must be some meaning behind what's going on in my life and actually knowing the God of the universe who loves us and cares for us. See, the more we really know God, the less mystery and less anxiety there is about the details and connections of our lives. Not because we know all of the reasons, not because we we can tell for sure what exactly God is doing, but because we know the one who is making everything happen. See, God is not just an impersonal force like karma, something that we just kind of hope will, will turn our way if we do the right thing. We know God's character. We know his disposition towards humanity because we've seen his track record. We've seen his activity all through the generations of humanity and especially, and especially in, in the pages of Scripture. See, through the Old Testament, the kind of thing we're seeing here happens again and again, that, that God's people have a sense. People have a sense. Look, God is at work. Sometimes he manifests himself in a visible way and clearly he's at work. Other times, they're saying that God must be at work behind the scenes. But it really isn't until the New Testament where we have this crystallized statement of what God is doing and, and how he's working behind the scenes. You could say Joseph foreshadowed it. Remember Joseph saying what you meant for evil, God meant for good. But then you get Paul in Romans 8.28. And he says this famous verse. Here's what he says. And we know that those who love God, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now some have said that the entire book of Esther is actually one big illustration for Romans 8.28. Because through the whole book, God is hidden, and yet his sovereign hand is over all the events of the story. And that's why we say there's there's no coincidence for the Christian. In fact, what we always see is God's plan being unveiled little by little. We can't always see what's coming, but we know who is, who is at work. There's a great um, quote that I came across that I think is helpful. It's by J.C. Ryle, who is a, an Anglican bishop in the late 1800s, and he says this. He says, There is no such thing as chance or luck or accident in the Christian's journey through this world. All is arranged and appointed by God. Therefore, Let us seek to have an abiding sense of God's hand in all that befalls us. If we profess to be believers in Jesus Christ, let us strive to realize that a father's hand is measuring out our daily portion and that our steps are ordered by him. That last part is is the application. The first bit, he's just saying, look, this here is how God works. He's sovereign. He's in, in control of everything. Therefore, if that's true, here's how we should react. We should seek to have an abiding sense of trust in God, that every single thing is actually coming from the hand of God. Is that how you respond to the things in your life? Are you seeking to have an abiding sense of trust, of peace, of acceptance for the events in your life because you actually believe that God is the one who's, who's apportioning them out, like a father giving something, giving food to his, to his children? Is that your idea of your life and the details in it? Or, or do you think things just happen? Do you think there are some things that are happening that maybe God isn't really on top of? There are some things happening that he's forgotten about? See, there's lots of things in our lives that are, that are difficult to accept. Frustrating things. Things that we spend hours and hours trying to figure out, you know, what exactly is happening and why it's happening. What we're seeing here from the wisdom of of Bishop Ryle, is that we should probably spend more time thinking about the who in our life. Like, like, who is God? Do I really believe that he's for me and that he loves me? Because if I believe that, then this thing, which is difficult to understand, I will see it in light of his goodness, in light of his love and his commitment to me. In fact, that's how Paul kind of goes on to to explain or, or to round out his his statement in Romans 8, 28. He says that, look, all things are from God. And then he, he tags onto it. In verse 32, he says this. He says of God, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
The point he's making here is, look, there are going to be very difficult things in our lives. Things we, we can't understand. Things like persecution, things like famine and danger and, and cancer and infertility and loneliness. All, all of these things. And the question is, are we, are we going to allow ourselves to be tempted to doubt God's love for us? Are we going to have the idea that, that God's forgotten us or God's abandoned us? I mean, this must have been the things that the Jews were struggling with back in the kingdom of Persia at this very moment. Thinking to themselves, is God still our God? Is he still for us? Looking at the edict, the death decree, knowing in months they're going to be attacked, thinking to themselves, does God still love us? The promises he made to us, are they still true? The blessing for us is that we know some things that they they didn't know. They, They couldn't see back then. We know the depth of God's love. Because we know about the cross. We know that he didn't even spare his own son. That that, that is a, a visible, real world picture of his love for us. That he would send his own son to suffer and die on our behalf, to set us free from sin. All of that should fill us with a greater sense of who God is. And should help us to better understand the details of our lives. Even the difficult ones. Even the ones that, that are hard to reconcile with a good and loving God, and yet we can see if God would go to that length to ensure that we have eternal hope, then we can be sure that he's involved in the minute details of our lives and the difficult details of our lives. See, Nestor chapter 6, we do get this, this amazing uh, pulling back of the curtain of God's sovereign activity, his meticulous sovereignty, that every single detail God is working out for his good. But what we need to understand is it's not just the amazingness of the connections. It's not just the, the coincidences that should fill us with hope. It's, it's the fact that we know who's making the connections. We know whose plan this is all about. I mean, for your own life, think about it this way. Every single thing that's brought you to this point has all been laid out by the plan of God. And he's done it because he loves you. It's easier to see when you look back, I think. As I look back... The difficult things in my life, I can see them with greater clarity, but there are some things that we still will not be able to understand. But that's okay. That's okay because we know the one who's writing the story. We know the depth of his love. We know his power. We know that he's able to to organize every single thing. And if that is true then, let me ask you this. How would our reaction to the events of our life change if we really did believe these things? If every time something came into our life that was difficult to accept, we thought to ourselves, look, this has actually come from the hand of God. I think if we believed that more, there would probably be less complaining, probably less um, worry, probably less time spent spinning in terms of um, feeling negative about ourselves, feeling lost. I think we'd be more helpful, more faithful, and probably more useful in terms of what God is actually trying to do in us and, and through us. So this is, this is one of the blessings of the book of Esther, that we begin to see the, the mechanics of the world and in our lives. It is an amazing story of coincidences, but it's more than that. It's better than that. It's better because it's a story of God. Even though he's hidden, even though he's never named or even prayed to, it is a story about God and his work and his love for his people. And the great thing is that that love has only grown, in a sense. The revelation of that love has only grown through the pages of Scripture and in our lives. So I'm going to end by praying for us, praying that we would have this abiding sense of trust that everything in our lives is from the hand of God and it is a good and gracious hand. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I do thank you for, for your love, for your grace, for the book of Esther that that makes clear to us some things that are so difficult for us to grasp, so difficult for us day to day, Lord, to actually believe that every single thing, good and bad, is from you. And yet what you show us in the pages of Scripture is that that's always how you've worked and and you've done the very thing that we need to ensure that we, we know your love, we experience your love, and that we have hope in the midst of the darkness. The cross, Lord Jesus, is, is your is the best way that you've shown your love. And so I pray that the cross would be the forefront of our mind, 
and that we would see that that too is part of your plan and even the details of our life today, thousands of years later, is still an outworking of your love for us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to believe that you are at work and to be faithful with the small things of the life that you've given us. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.